Okay, so you took object-oriented Java, but you could barely contain everything, or it was a long time ago. Now you're doing projects or preparing for an internship and you need a refresher. Well, here's the top five things you need to remember about object-oriented Java. Number one, classes and objects. Classes are like blueprints and are what are used to make objects. First, you give it a name, then build the class by adding any variables you need. Add constructors, which are the methods called when an object is created from the class. And then any methods you want for the behaviors of the class. Objects are instantiations or instances of a class, meaning I can use the class like a blueprint to create as many objects as I want. Here's an example. I make two objects out of the class type users. I use the constructors to pass in different usernames. Now I have two versions of the class, two objects. They have the same value fields and methods and are of the type user, but are separate from each other. Change one and I do not affect the other. You can check out a simple video I did on the concepts of objects and classes by clicking here. Number two, inheritance. Inheritance works exactly how you think of it in real life. This is something that a parent gives to their children or in the case of Java, a super class gives to its children classes. Let me illustrate. In the example before, I created the user class. Well, a subclass, or a more specific class I could make, would be a student class. A student is a type of user, so I can inherit the value and fields and methods from the user class. I can create as many inherited classes from user that I want. I start by creating a class and using the keyword extends, then specifying the class I want to inherit from, user. Then I can add additional variables and functionality while keeping all the same stuff from user. Why would I want to do this? Well, three big reasons. One, it saves me typing. Instead of retyping all the code they share in common, I type it once and can have as many subclasses as I would like. Two, I can keep only those things unique to a student and teacher together. A teacher doesn't have a current class, and a student wouldn't have, say, courses they're teaching. And three, because student and teacher have the same parent or super class, they share the same origin type, which lends itself handy to polymorphism, which I'll talk about later. Here's a challenge. Using the code provided in the description, add a teacher class that inherits from user and add your own unique variables and methods that only a teacher would have. Number three, abstract classes. The word abstract literally means existing in thought or as an idea, but not having a concrete existence. In programming, classes are abstract if they're too generic to describe anything concrete by themselves and act more as a type or a category. You wouldn't want me to make you a sandwich without specifying what specific type to make. Trust me. Sandwich would be abstract, PB&J of type sandwich would be a more normal class. Back to our user class. Now that we have more specific users, like a student, it doesn't make sense to create just a user. A user should always have a more specific type, like a student or teacher. And that's how we'll know what information to give the user when they log into our system. So we make the user class abstract. That's it. Now I can have classes that inherit from user, but you cannot create just a user. This old code would now throw an error. Bob and George would need to be of more specific type, like students. Number four, arrays. Arrays are not exclusively an object-oriented concept, but are so crucial to how we store and use objects, I thought it needed a review. I like to think of a single dimensional array as a bookshelf. The name of the array is referring to the whole bookcase, and the index refers to one of the shelves which holds one of our variables or objects. I can make an array of student objects and assign the three students I've created so far directly to it. Of course, I could also specify the size of the array and then later assign the students to certain locations. Indexes are the label we use to refer to each location in the array, or in my shelf example, each shelf. The first index is always zero and goes up by one from there. So the student Bob is at index zero and Jill is at index two. You may remember one of the beauties of arrays is being able to use loops to go through and access the data. It may seem trivial now with an array of three objects, but when the arrays get larger or when you don't always know what is in them, loops are essential. Remember the key here is that as the variable i changes, so does the location in the array that I am pointing to. Number five, polymorphism. 
Not to be confused with Yu-Gi-Oh's polymerization, which means to combine many, polymorphism means many forms. An object can take the form of itself or its parent classes. Polymorphism might most easily be explained by using some Russian stacking dolls. Imagine the large doll is the parent class, let's say our user class, and then the smaller dolls could be our teacher and student classes. Teacher and student both fit under user because they are type user. If student had its own subclasses, those two could fit under user or student because they would be a user and a student. Because of this, we can make an array of type users and it will hold all classes derived from users, or student and teachers in our case. You can see how this would simplify our code, because I don't need to know beforehand if it's a student or a teacher to be able to hold it in the array. The same principle works when passing objects to functions. I'm not sure if a student or a teacher is going to log in next, but because they're both users, I can set my function parameter to accept any user objects and then go on from there. That's just some of the ways polymorphism is handy. Thanks for watching. Check out the code from this video in the description, and if you have any questions, feel free to leave them below.